In previous episodes of this series, I introduced you to my proprietary stock scanning application called Stock Trend Finder. This Ruby on Rails program actually has two main parts, a stock scanner application and a journaling tool that has functionality similar to Twitter. But unlike Twitter, I use this app only locally to privately record my thinking on stock market action. This tool has a few specialized enhancements that allow me to better tag and follow up on my prior predictions so that I can better learn and improve my trading over time. In this episode, I'm going to be extracting the journaling part of this application into its own application that I'm going to rename as Stonk Notes. Let's start that by starting a new Rails project in the latest version of Rails, version 6.1. Currently, that old app is running Rails 4.2, and it uses jQuery for all the dynamic front-end features. I plan to copy all the relevant pieces of code over to the new repo, updating aspects of it to use the Rails Hotwire framework where appropriate. Now that I've got my base Rails project set up with a gem file and database connection, the first step to converting my legacy app will be copying over the database structure from my old project to the new one. In Rails, this can easily be done by copying the relevant data table information from the previous app's schema.rb file into a migration within the new application. Taking this approach of rebuilding the application from scratch has three advantages. One, starting with a fresh Rails 6.1 application, allows me to bypass the complexities of navigating the deprecations that occur between versions of Rails. Since I'll be upgrading from Rails version 4.2, a lot has changed, and I'd have to walk through the process of upgrading for each major and minor release individually up until the latest version, and that can be really time-consuming especially since I might not just run into deprecation issues with Rails, but other dependencies as well. The code in this application is small enough that the amount of work to rebuild it completely is manageable. And two, I'm breaking apart a specific piece of functionality from the legacy application. From a conceptual standpoint, it makes sense to start with a fresh repo because I'm decoupling it from a larger system. And three, in this application, I'll be taking a completely new engineering approach to how this thing is going to work under the hood. A lot of this legacy application uses coffee script and messy jQuery observers. Since the new front-end architecture is going to be radically different in its approach at the very core, I might as well just recode the new logic piece by piece. So here I've got a large initial migration set up to kick off the new database structure for this application. After I run that migration, I'm going to load the data from the legacy application into my new database using a SQL file that I extracted from the Postgres backup utility pgdump. Now, this procedure works fine because I mainly use this application locally, but if I were in a production setting where this is a mission-critical system, I definitely handle it differently. The steps I outline here would be the same, but I would probably write some sort of script to automate this copy of data in real time and first test it in a staging environment just to make sure that we minimize the downtime and we don't have any gaps in our data. In the next steps of transitioning this program, I'm going to rename some of the database columns to remove the references to stock twits and name them stonk notes. Yes, Initially, this program was designed so that I could not just view my notes, but share them on Twitter and the Stock Twits website if I wanted to. If this were a production environment with a lot of throughput, I'd probably postpone this step until later so that I can prioritize the pullover of the database data from the legacy production system. In other words, I wait until the new system is completely live and working well before I introduce any sort of breaking changes to the data structure. But in this case, it's okay because this is just a local app that I use for a hobby. At this point, I'm going to skip over a lot of the boilerplate code that I wrote to get the basic landing page of this website working. If you want to see the finished product of this video in its entirety, check out the GitHub link that I've posted in the video description. And while you're at it, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to get more videos like this. 
So I'm at the point now where I have the view templates to match the skeleton of the original page that I'm trying to rebuild. The index page controller loads the most recent stock notes and displays them on the page. The very basic Ruby on Rails data flow. And this is where I want to introduce the Hotwire Turbo. Since the content of this part of the page is going to be dynamic, this is the perfect section to convert into a Turbo frame. This part of the page corresponds to this div in the view template labeled stock notes content. Let's turn this into a turbo frame so that it will become a dynamically loaded part of the web page. I'm going to add a source equals stock notes path here so that turbo knows where to get this information from. And of course I got to make that route and do a little rearranging here in my controller. I'm also going to change my view template for the stock notes index so that it just renders a list of stock notes, the part that will appear in the dynamic section. The overall page with the navigation buttons and all can be moved to its own action and later its own controller called home. Eventually I'll refactor this to keep the stock notes controller just rendering the stock notes related stuff. I realize this might be a little bit hard to follow along, so I just want to remind you that I do have a GitHub link up in the description if you want to take a closer look at this code. But just follow along with me as I'm doing an overview of the basic concepts here. So now if we go to the stonk notes index path, we're going to see a rendering of the list of stonk notes without the navigation sections on the right hand side of the page. I still have the title stonk notes journal and the add new note button. And maybe I should move these out of the template as well, but I'm going to be using this to highlight an interesting feature of the new Turbo framework. So see how on this page we still see our Turbo frame tag? Well, Turbo is smart enough that when it loads this URL to place inside of another dynamic Turbo frame, it's just going to make use of the stock notes content section and use what's in here to replace the Turbo frame in the other page template. So Turbo Frame is a placeholder as a destination, but when you're loading content, it also serves as a matching placeholder for Turbo to find the source content that it wants to populate as well. So now I'm back on the home page where we have the overall template, including navigation, and Turbo is going to lazy load the dynamic content when we refresh. Now, as you can see here in the web request, it performed a separate request to the stock notes route which is the page that we were just looking at. And if we look at the HTML delivered by that request, you'll see that it's a complete HTML page, but Turbo just stripped out the Stonk Notes content Turbo frame and inserted that into the current page that we're looking at. Now it's nice that we've gotten a sample of data to lazy load via Turbo, but what if we want to scroll down our page a bit and load some more content? To accomplish that, I'll be using a feature called Turbo Streams, which conveniently allows you to add or delete information displayed within a Turbo frame. But in order for our program to know exactly which data to load next, I'm going to have to add a parameter to our Stonk Notes index query that tells it which ID number to start at. And I'm going to call this param cursor. So if this works according to plan, I should be able to provide a number in the request and it will provide me only the notes with the IDs below that number. In this case, I'm using ID number 31987 since that's the ID for the item at the bottom of the list that we're currently viewing. And there you go. The ID number filtering works. So now I'm going to create a button at the bottom of our page that says load more. When I click this button, it should load the next batch of stonk notes and append them to the list that we currently see. The way I'm going to make this request for that data will be through a simple form with a button triggering the submit action. It has to be a form because this needs to use the post request method with Ajax. Turbo automatically intercepts your form post requests and inserts headers telling the server that we are going to be using the Turbo stream content type. Let's take a look at the code in my controller. As you can see, I'm processing the Turbo stream kind of request by rendering a Turbo stream. And Rails gives you some nice helpers for this. Turbo stream append will tell the client side Turbo to add these items to the bottom of the specified Turbo frame. So now let's go into the web browser and click this button. And as you can see, it loaded a new batch of stock notes that start at the ID number of the item that's at the bottom of the list. But I kind of cheated on this 
because if you look back at my template, I hard-coded the ID number to start at. Every time we do a load of data, this figure should change because the ID number of the stock note at the bottom of the list will be updated to something different. And how do we make this number dynamic? For that, you're going to have to watch part 2 of my video where I introduce StimulusJS and do some more complex operations like this in the client-side browser. So be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button so that you don't miss the next episode where I'll be covering StimulusJS. See you there!